Hey, uh, hi guys. Uh, good evening and welcome to a fresh new session of market risk modeling using SAS. Okay. <clears throat> so, uh, welcome Abhishek, welcome Ajaz. Uh, before we just start off with the discussions for the session today, uh, let's just, um, you know, uh, just go and have a, uh, like a refresher of the concepts that we have done, right? So, <clears throat> in the last class, what we were discussing was, uh, we started talking about the basic uh, sources of risk uh, which a bank faces and out of that and over there what we saw was that uh, the three major sources of risk are uh, the market risk the operational risk and the and uh, credit risk so basically credit risk is the sources of risk which actually uh, originates from uh, <clears throat> you know which originates from the lending side of things so basically when a bank actually lends out to a borrower the I mean, depending on the fact whether the borrower would pay, pay it back or not, uh, <clears throat> I mean, the bank would face a credit risk. So basically, if the borrower takes a, a loan and does not pay back it in due time, then we uh, say that, yes, the borrower, uh, then we say that, yes, a credit risk has actually happened, right? So basically, a credit risk happens as a part of defaults on part of the borrowers, uh, due to loan restructurings uh, and other such factors, right? Now, apart from that, uh, apart from credit risk, the two other major sources of risk are market risk and operational risk. And within market risk, we would actually uh, explore different kinds or, or the different other sources of risk that are there. So, so basically, uh, within market risk, what we saw was that uh, there is counterparty credit risk, there's asset price risk, there is interest rate risk, and obviously, yes, there is exchange exchange risk, exchange rate risk. So when we are talking about these sources of risk, so uh, at each of these sources of risk or each of the sources of the fluctuations which bring about this risk, we get to see that uh, a bank gets exposed to a different kind or a different source of risk. So basically, uh, in the domain in uh, in the domain of credit risk, the bank faces the uh, risk from the lending side of things. In market risk, uh, the uh, I mean market risk affects banks through the different sources through which banks invest into risk, right? In, invest uh, into different assets. So basically, if the bank is actually investing in the asset of uh, some some foreign company and that uh, foreign company goes out for a liquidation then uh, then the market risk or i mean then the investment risk or what do you say or any kind of a counterpart uh, or a counterparty credit risk seeps in through one particular uh, through the investment channel and we saw that most of this kind of uh, most of these risks have been seen during the 2008 financial crisis right so so there, uh, there was a lot of interplay between each of these risks. Now, uh, okay, I'm coming to your uh, question, Ajaz, in a short time. Okay, so basically, uh, when I'm talking about uh, the bank's objectives, the bank's objectives uh, would be to actually either to, uh, you know, there would always be a trade-off between growth and conservatism. So the objective of the bank would be to grow as well as be conservative and prevent itself from collapse. Now coming to the uh, question that Ajaz had posed, will liquidity risk come under market risk? Uh, liquidity risk is something which would not be driven by the market factors as uh, per se. So basically, a liquidity risk would not actually arise, you know, as a fluctuation in the market directly, or you know, the market variables directly. But it, but liquidity risk may be the outcome arising from any of the sources of risk. So, for example, if a bank is lending out in a very frivolous manner, without appropriate regulations and uh, you know buffers in place, then if there is a huge case of default then uh, this bank might end up with a liquidation risk. That is, it might not have sufficient funds to pay out to the depositors and may go into liquidation, right? So liquidity risk would be an outcome of the market risk, but 
it would not be a part of the risk uh, you know it would not be something which is caused by the market fluctuations or by the market forces per se but liquidity risk can be a possible outcome of a specific market risk or of the outcome of a specific movement of the market factors right however uh, we would be exploring a little bit of uh, we would be exploring liquidity risk over here as well uh, but to not that extent over here mainly our focus would be based around asset price risk which is the stock market risk the interest rate risk exchange rate risk and counterparty credit risk so in today's session we would be uh, so in the last class we started talking about uh, what a stock market risk is or what is an asset price risk is what are the different kinds of challenges that we might face right so over here today what we would be doing is we would be exploring uh, the asset price risk in greater details and uh, in tomorrow's session we would be exploring the other three types of risk especially interest rate risk and exchange rate risk <clears throat> and then next saturday we would be uh, talking about counterparty credit risk so uh, by the uh, so my target would be to cover up each of these four risks and the respective modeling techniques uh, by the end of next week so an overview of the two so once we have done the overview for the first four or five classes, then we would take up each of the risks. We would explore the different regulations in place, the core modeling techniques like uh, value at risk, then uh, then time series models and, and other associated factors, and then look into how the industry models are developed, how would the data set look like, and so on. But for the four, first four or five classes, we need to have a hang of the different uh, risks. And then what we will be doing is after we have explored the risks, the sources of the risk, the next part, the next way or uh, way forward would be to explore the different instruments through which market risk may spread like derivatives, swaps, options, uh, exotic options, etc. So, so we would be exploring the instruments and the regulation. So first the sources of the risk, then the regulations in place, then the instruments, and then finally the modeling techniques, model development, how the validations are done and so on right so that will be uh, the way forward for the market risk modeling that uh, we that i have actually planned to and as we proceed if you have anything you know, that any feedbacks that you want to give anything new anything you want me to discuss in details then we can take that up as well right okay so basically in the last class we started talking about uh, asset price risk right so today we will talk about uh, different components of the asset price risk in uh, greater details so basically uh, just let's uh, refresh as to why this asset price risk would actually occur or when does an how does an asset price risk actually occur so basically what we know is that every day uh, so whenever it, when there whenever there is a stock which is being traded on an index right so be it in india be it the sensex be it the nifty or in usa be it the nyac uh, be it nasdaq so whatever so wherever a particular stock is traded and listed right so for given the demand and supply the price of the stocks keep on fluctuating right so uh, any stock so whenever we are talking about any asset like so basically whenever we are talking about the shares of any stocks so there are two important concepts to it. One important part is the opening price of the stock, right? So there is an opening price. And at the end of the day, there is a closing price of a stock. So there is an opening price. And there is a closing price. And that there is a closing price. So I'm just discussing this at a very stock level. There is an opening price and that there is a closing price. Now what happens is. Now, say basically a stock opens at 
uh, say rupees uh, 10. So the opening price of the of a particular share of a stock is rupees 10, right? And uh, so basically there is a borrower, uh, so there is an investor who actually buys this stock. Say there is one who is actually buying say 50 un or 100 units of this stock, right? Who buys 100 units of this stock. Now, therefore, the total opening price or I mean the total volume that this person has purchased is worth rupees 1000. So as I would say that he's invest, so he has actually invested rupees 1000 into this particular stock. Now, assuming that this guy is uh, a person who trades his who buys a stock in the beginning of the day and then he is planning to sell it off at the end of the day so i'm not going i'm just taking a very simplistic model just to explain the concept of the market the asset price risk that is there so basically what happens is uh, so say at the end of the closing on the closing or at the end uh, when the stock is closing the stock closes at 11 rupees per stock given the change in the demand and supply what happens is the stock price changes right now at the 100 units the the total value of his investment is rupees 100 right so it is 11 so if I look into his returns, right? So this guy had invested thousand rupees, and at the end of the day, what he has made is he has made hundred and eleven hundred rupees. Therefore, his return on investment, his return on investment is eleven hundred minus hundred divided by thousand. 1100 minus 1000 divided by 1000. So it is 100 divided by 1000, which is 0.1 into 100. So what he has achieved is a 100 or, or what he has obtained is a 10% return at the end of the day. Right? So this is what uh, the structure is. Now, basically, say let's let's look into this. So, so basically, he has actually made a profit, and as they say, that he has ended up in green. Now, similarly, one possibility could also have been that the stock could have ended up instead of ending up in rupees uh, eleven. The stock could have easily ended up in rupees nine. Right. So now the total value of his investment would have been rupees nine hundred. So basically, the investment that he had made of what rupees thousand at the beginning of the day has actually ended up. Add being 900 because there has been a fall in the overall demand of the stock or because of some news or because of some market sentiment the market price has or the value of the investment has gone down to 900 now at the end of the day his he stands in the red and he has actually lost minus 10 percent on the investment that he has made right now just imagine so this is what the market or well, this is what an asset simply what an asset price risk is and the asset price risk is determined by the volatility is not only determined by the average returns on the stock but also on the spread of the average returns that is on the volatility of the average returns the average dispersion that the stock exhibits about its average return 
So if the stock price ends up at 900, what happens is now I know that I have ended up in a loss, right? And I am unable to recover my money from the market. Now, how would this? So this is a simple asset price risk, right? Now, let us try and understand the impact that this risk can have on the market. So basically, let us assume that when this guy started or when this guy had invested in the market, when he had tried investing in this, uh, when he tried investing it in the market, what he did was he had actually borrowed the money from some financial institution or he had borrowed the money from someone, right, at a given rate of interest. Now, the idea was that, say, suppose he borrowed, um, say, 1,000 bucks from a lender at, say, a rate of uh, 3%, right? And he had expected that the stock price based on his expectations on and on the market forecasts what he had tried doing was he tried predicting whether and how that that the uh, or he had predicted that he would gain on an interest of 10 percent and he would pay off the three percent to this guy and his profit would have been seven percent right so say suppose i have a creditor over here or a credit house Suppose I have a creditor over here. Now, now when the market actually fails to pay him that necessary return of minus 10%, there is always a chance that this particular guy might go ahead and default, right? And he might say that, no, I am unable to meet the obligation that I had committed to based on that on, on the transaction document, I am just unable to pay back, right? So in that case, there is this creditor who would also suffer a particular loss, right? So the impact which arises from the market or the shocks which arises from the market would also manifest if there is a whole channel of people who are linked to that market risk. So obviously, this creditor is not directly investing into the market, but he is actually lending the money to someone who is investing it in the market. And given that there is an asset price fluctuation, right? Given that there is an asset price fluctuation, there it becomes a bit of, I mean, given that there is an asset price fluctuation or riskiness involved in the market, what would ideally happen is, that this risk which originates from the investment in the asset price risk also gets transmitted to this creditor, right? And this type of a risk and this type of a transaction that has happened is a, or it's a typical example of a counterparty risk or a counterparty default risk. So where there is this guy who had taken the money basis a document and, has, and was supposed to pay back the money back on this given date or at this given time and given date, but given the market fluctuations, he was unable to meet his uh, obligations and hence he defaulted, right? So this kind of an arrangement is a typical case of, it's a typical case of a counterparty credit risk. Now, when I talk about counterparty risk, it is, uh, I mean, it is talked about in terms of a major, I mean, in a very specific framework, so where there is a counter, uh, so where there is a party which promises to pay a certain amount after a certain span of time, right? And that amount is due on a given date. And on that date, this guy is unable to honor his commitments, right? So there are, so counterparty credit risk often arises in the process where a person is trying to hedge some kind of a risk, right? So in, in an attempt to hedge a particular kind of a risk, if the borrower on I mean, on the other hand, on the other party defaults, then it leads to a counterparty credit risk. So I just created out an arbitrary example to create that framework and try relating 
this fluctuation in the stock market to the fluctuation in the lending market as well right now now this is just one particular this is a very small case now try and imagine that there are many millions of lenders who are in uh, million of investors who are investing on a regular basis in these stock markets in these asset prices right and there are a lot of people who borrow from the market or who, who, who take up money from the market and invest in, in the stock market they make their profits they give it to the lenders and in between they earn their profits also on the other hand there are borrowers who borrow from the banks who take up money from the banks and they try to invest it into a market right so so i mean they can subscribe to in some kind of a particular loan product where they borrow money and thereby they play it in the market now the question that comes out is assessing this kind of a risk is actually very important because this is not a very typical kind of a credit borrowing that is generally done so for example if i take a home loan i am taking a home loan to just buy a house so that asset is known now the bank knows that the bank can actually take out that money and i mean take my home back if i default and sell it off and thereby make a profit out of it but over here in this kind of a setup it is not possible or it becomes very risky for the bank to do this kind of of because this kind of investments are inherently risky because you know that the money that you are giving out to a person he would actually be using that to trade in the market and in the short run the market is exposed to very severe fluctuations given this given this there needs to be a very strict assessment before uh, or, or assessment of the fund for which uh, i mean assessment of the financial statements of the investors and to check whether he has the affordability to pay back in case the market run goes through a major shock now another important factor to take out is that when the investments are going in right so when someone is taking money and trying to invest it in the market or some kind of a lending strategies or or lending of that type is going on in the economy it is it becomes very important to understand or investigate the source of price rises because as we had discussed in the last class we talked about uh, stock market bubbles right we talked about irrational exuberance so we talked about market manias especially so basically if we if someone sees that the market is actually overheated right and if someone is willing to invest money or putting in money at that point of time there is always a very high chance that the market might crash in a very small instant of time and that person might get stuck with that hot potato potato as they call it therefore when a stock price is uh, or whenever there is a fluctuation in the stock prices whenever there are movements across uh, the asset prices it's very important to assess the way the movement is actually happening it's very assess to uh, look into the different uh, field matrices that the asset is actually displaying right so obviously one of a few important major matrices uh, that we generally need to look into while we go for investments right or when while investing into an asset price are factors like uh, is i mean it's not only factors which involve the return and the volatility right so one one very important factor over here would be the return on the asset right the next thing that we would uh, that we would also need to know is uh, the volatility of the asset right so there must be a volatility we must assess the volatility of the asset while talking about the volatility i have different uh, measures of volatility uh, or different points to where to record the volatility so basically one is called the open to open volatility or the other is to measure the close to close volatility so uh, open to open volatility is to look into the opening price of an asset on day 1 and to look into the opening price of the asset on day 2 and thereby find out the returns that are possible and thereby measure the overall fluctuation 
so basically when i talk about volatility there are two type mostly two types of data that we look into open to open and close to close now basically for uh, data collection purposes if i want to collect the data then obviously uh, it's mostly the close to close volatility figure i mean the close to close uh, stock readings are mostly preferred because it is believed that the closing price captures all the possible fluctuations that has happened during the day and it's considered to be a more accurate price uh, more accurate uh, figure for the asset prices now uh, when i talk about uh, so obviously yes there is return there is obviously volatility now within volatility when we are talking about stock market volatility or, or asset price volatility there are two types of volatility based on the the time point where they are recorded right so one is called the interval day volatility or that's the day to day uh, volatility is so the interday volatility and the next is the intraday volatility interday volatility the other that we talk about is an intraday volatility intraday volatility right so these are the two uh, volatility measures that we generally uh, that we generally get to see over there right uh, these two are very important uh, measures so we'll come down to uh, greater discussions about them the next that we have over here is uh, which is which is obviously a very well known ratio called the price earnings ratio or the pye ratio right so it's the price earning ratio that i have okay the next thing that i also have over there is uh, so i have the price to say uh, so we have the dividend yield we have the dividend yield then we have the price to book value ratio <clears throat> so dividend yield then we also have uh, measures like the price to the book value ratio so the book value ratio uh, <clears throat> we have dividend yield uh, then another important ratio that we generally have is uh, price to book value ratio price earning ratio uh, the gdp to market the market capitalization to the gdp ratio the market capitalization to the gdp ratio market capitalization by the gdp ratio right so these are different kinds of matrices in terms of which we can actually assess the you know uh, what should i say we can assess the behavior of or we can assess the asset price risk right so what type so is so how risky or how overpriced is the market or is the market moving in a uh, proper fashion so then there are again technical analysis there are fundamental analysis which are carried out right so uh, based on that we can actually so basically our objective or our idea is to assess the first of all assess the fundamental value of the asset right and and try and understand that if the market is actually moving as per the fundamentals what should be the growth rate of the market and presently the idea is at what rate is the market presently growing so these are the two basic questions that you need to answer whenever you are trying to assess market risk also analysis can be done at a very overall level where you talk about this right so also another important factor which can help you assess asset price risk is 
the interest rate movement how does the bond uh, you know the alternate investment uh, instruments how does how do the overall interest rate pattern in the economy move right now for example if i think about um, the indian economy at present right or so basically when you see that the 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 overall interest rate in the economy is actually going down right so basically then being a rational individual being a rational investor what you actually want to do is you want to shift your asset to a better mode right so you want to shift your asset to altern or your investments into alternate assets so if you see that the interest rate in the banking sector is actually going down then there would obviously be a tendency for one to move the money into the stock markets right and move into alternate form of investments into alternate asset instruments right so in that way if you see that the rate of interest in the economy is growing then you generally see that the investments more investments being shifted from the market to the banking sector to the government bonds on the other hand if the treasury rates or the government bond rates actually start going down then you would expect that the market uh, the markets to actually grow and expand right now on the other hand if you see that the government rates are so less i mean they are so less that you would always want to put on your entire money into your markets right and that is where you would generally see that whenever any government tries to bring in a consumption boom by all by you know affecting interest rates so they you want to expand your consumption in your economy and for that what you want to do is you want to take a loan driven expansion so what you do is you reduce the uh, rate of interest on your consumption loans and thereby you try to expand consumption then along with that the side effect that comes out is those people who had invested in government bonds and government who had the money in their banks they they prefer to withdraw the money from there and siphon the money to the stock markets and as such what you see is with a boom in the consumption side the stock markets also tries or the asset markets also expands right or they also grow and that is reflected in the the stock markets and with an increase in the consumption right as this consumption segment grows you know there is not only a demand with demand also increases supply and with an increase in the supply there is an increase in labor demand and with an increase in labor demand what you see is a growth in the average income of the people which gets related to the and which gets correlated with the increase in the real estate boom right so all these features one thing therefore you will see that interest rates play a very critical role in the stability in the macro stability of an economy right so that is why this rate of interest has always been a particular uh, technique which had always helped uh, in to channelize investments in the uh, you know in the appropriate and in an efficient or an optimal manner now given this given this uh, background right so given this background uh, we'll come to the uh, ex we'll explore the interest rates and the impact of the interest rates on uh, the asset prices later on let's uh, focus on most of these basic concepts initially right let's understand uh, how do a change in these different variables how would they actually impact the stock markets right so basically uh, so basically what happens is uh, the to start about or to uh, to start the discussions on so let's uh, talk about any asset right any asset a asset a right at time period t the value of the asset or the uh, asset takes the value at right now whenever i am investing an asset in a market it is identified by two things or or the safety or the security of an asset is distinguished between by two things one is the mean return on the asset
the mean returns on the asset. which I call mu t that is the mean returns at time p at tieth time period is called mu t right and the second that I talk about is the volatility so the volatility so the volatility is nothing but the overall standard deviation about the mean returns, right? Now, uh, one important thing is what we need to understand is, so, so when we are assessing an asset, right? When I'm deciding whether I should invest between asset AT or A prime T, then I need to look into the asset distribution for the two, right? So basically there is an asset AT and there is another asset uh, say I'll call it A prime T right so A prime T is I mean A prime T has some distribution it follows some distribution with say mu T prime so I'm saying that it's it's a given as uh, mean and a given standard deviation so it has its own uh, modeling parameters right so AT dashed and uh, and this asset AT has a mu t mean mu t and sigma t now the question comes out is how do I identify which is the more risky asset and and how do I actually go about you know identifying uh, the overall how do I go about identifying which is a better me i mean which is a better uh, asset and which is a more investable asset so if i have to consider just the asset the mean returns and the and if i just to consider the mean return and the volatility i would just look into i would just look into the mu t and if i have to just take the decision based on the returns i would just look into the mean returns and the overall volatility right so before i talk about mean returns and volatility let me just define what our mean return or what a return is actually right so, so basically there is this asset t which at time period t the price of this is pt right so generally we consider uh, this to be the log of the price Basically, since returns are uh, decided, I mean, when we, since we talk about returns in terms of the percentages, right? So basically, it is always easier to, you know, transform the variable or transform the uh, price series into the log versions, right? So the log of the price P at time period T is small pt. And price... Uh, t minus 1 so the return at time period t will be the price today that is at time period t minus the price that was yesterday divided the price that was yesterday so basically it is like log of the price in time period t minus 1 right so the returns or the log of the returns rt is defined as log p t minus 1 by log pt divided by log pt minus 1 so there is a minor error that i have done
this is log pt minus pt minus 1 right so this is what the return series is So this is how we generally define a logarithmic return, right? Now, having defined this returns, uh, the next thing that we need to know is what exactly is the volatility of the returns, right? Now, if I compute the returns over a period of time, obviously, I will have an average return or I will get a long run mean returns, right? I'll, I'll get a mean return. So the question that comes out over here is that, so for a return series over a, or a series of returns taken over a point of time, so weekly returns, monthly returns, annual returns. So I will get an R T bar or a mean return. Now this mean return can also be thought of as a stochastic variable. So we'll talk about the formalizations a little later. Let's not talk about that. So basically what I'll have is I'll always have a mean return, right? I'll have a mean return. I'll have a mean return, right? Now from this mean return using this return series and the mean return, what I can do is I can compute an average variability of the returns. So I can compute an average variability which I will call the volatility. So this volatility is defined as root over 1 by n minus 1. So where n minus 1 stands for the n stands for the number of the trading sessions, right? So this divided by RT minus RT bar whole square. So this will be your volatility, right? So where N stands for the number of uh, trading sessions that we have had over a given period. So if I'm com computing weekly returns, then it shows the number of trading sessions that I have had over the entire week, right? Based on close, close things. If I'm computing monthly returns, it will show me the monthly session, uh, the number of monthly trading sessions that I have had for that stock. If I'm computing annual return, it will show me the number of uh, annual instances where the trading has happened for the stock. And based on that, I'll compute the, I'll get the overall return and the overall deviation about this right so basically so over here this gives us an idea about the overall variability of the behavior of a stock overall variability right so these are the two basic metrics in terms of which I need to identify which one or which would be a better stock in which to invest now for doing that uh, so let's graphically look into that which one would be a better stock now, uh, one very important uh, factor is, or one very important characteristic of this is, of this, of, especially in asset prices markets, are greater the, you know, the as, uh, greater the uh, risk of a stock, the greater is the returns of the stock. Therefore, the higher the volatility that you get to see, the higher overall spread that you get to see, you know that higher is the return associated with the stock right 
So what we'll do is uh, let's just uh, look into this phenomena graphically. Right. So after this, so basically over here, what I'll have is, uh, Uh, so over here, what I'll have is I made a mistake. It's not the price. It's it will be the time, right? So I'll have the trading sessions or the time over here. Right. Uh, uh, over here, what we have is the return. So here I have the returns, right? Now, uh, let's uh, have a look into this. So basically, what I'm doing is so I have one. So this is one particular stock, right? So over here. So this is basically the mean returns associated with this stock. Right. And then I have another stock over here. Right. So over here, if I have a look into this stock, into the distribution of this particular stock, then what I see is that this is no, sorry. I have a stock over here, right? So basically, what you get to see is that, so let this be your uh, A. So let me, let this be the stock 80 or the asset 80. And let this be 80 dashed. So what I can clearly see from here is that even though the mean returns for both these stocks are more or less the same, right? But the spread for the spread of the returns for this stock AT is much more than the overall spread of the stock for AT dash. So therefore, the variability in the returns for this stock is particularly much higher right so basically even if I have a higher so basically given the returns right I would always opt for 80 than uh, 80 dashed than 80 because the spread of the returns in it is relatively more connected I mean that relative that is relatively more uh, you know it's more uh, concentrated so the spread is relatively less for 80 dash compared to 80 since given this spread what i can conclude is that 
the variability in the returns for AT dash is relatively lower than that of AT. And hence, what we would expect over here is that yes, uh, AT dash is a relatively less risky stock than AT. Right. So therefore, only looking into the mean returns would. So if I actually look into the mean returns, I would say that I would be indifferent between the two stocks. So looking into the mean returns is not only important, but also what I need to do is I need to look into the overall dispersion that is there. 